Good afternoon. My name is Gad Lebanon, and I'm Chief Economist in North America here at the Conference Board. Welcome to a, a special webcast that we have on uh, manufacturing. Um, we, uh, I will introduce my guests in, in a minute. I'll just um, tell you uh, very briefly what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to answer a few key questions. Why has the decline of manufacturing employment reversed? since the Great Recession, how are the skill requirements for manufacturing firm changing across different industry groups, what are some motivation firms have for bringing supply chain stages closer to a point of sale, and what steps should businesses be taking to improve long-term competitiveness. Um, a lot of the material that we'll talk about is uh, from a recent uh, report uh, by McKinsey, uh, and we'll have a, a, a McKinsey uh, partner here with us that I'll introduce in a minute. But before we get uh, to that, just a few uh, tips on uh, webcast tips. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, no need to wait until the end. You can ask them uh, by typing them in the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Uh, to download the presentation, you can do it via the file download pod at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, you can watch uh, a full screen by clicking the four arrows at the top right of your screen. If you have a minute at the end of the presentation, we'll really appreciate if you can complete a brief evaluation so we can incorporate your feedback in future shows. Uh, and if you want to watch this uh, webcast again or uh, share it with your colleagues, you can do it um, there will be on-demand um, versions available approximately 48 hours after the webcast on the Conference Board website. Also, for those of you interested in CPE credits, they are available. Please type your full name and email address in the space provided uh, and click OK for three pop-ups that will occur during the program. You have to stay online for the entire webcast to get those credits and CPE credits are available for participation in live webcast only. So uh, I want to um, introduce uh, my guests today. Um, first, uh, um, uh, in our studio, uh, Brian Shaitkin, a senior economist at the conference board and uh, uh, a very common uh, participant in our webcast. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Gad. I'm excited to get to go into more detail on manufacturing jobs. That's a story we've been talking a lot about in Economics Watch recently, and I think it's a story that our guests say will be able to shed some light on. Thank you, Brian. And, and speaking of the guests, uh, let me introduce Sri Ramsamui, Rams, Ramaswamy. I'm sure uh, I'm not the first one to butcher your name. Uh, uh, Sri is a uh, a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. Um, welcome, Sri. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to participate and share our research. And yes, you are definitely not the first, nor <laughs> the last one to put your mind. Yeah, um, thank you for um, making me feel a little better about that. I um, probably will get it better uh, when I thank you at the end of the show. We'll see. Um, so, um, as, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is coming from uh, Making It in America, a new McKinsey Global Institute uh, report. Uh, so uh, we will uh, and, and we'll, uh, also supplement uh, some of the slides from that report with um, work that we're doing at the conference board. So together we, I think, uh, prepared a nice deck uh, of slides that we will share with you an interesting program. So Brian, uh, maybe you'll take us through the background of uh, why we're talking about this topic today and where the manufacturing sector is. So it starts, Gad, by looking at where is the labor market overall. And this chart presents a remarkably happy story. If you look at the blue line, unemployment rate, not only is that 4.1% number that came out in December lower than any time during the span of this chart back to 2007, it is lower than any time since 1970, except for a few months in the year 2000. So that 4.1 figure is a remarkably low figure. It illustrates the overall strength of the economy. 
But on the other side, we have presented here two measures of wage growth. We have average private hourly earnings, which is the red line, and an a measure produced by the Atlanta Fed, which is the green line, which shows not all workers, as is the case with the average uh, hourly earnings measure, but rather those workers who have maintained employment over the last 12 months. And what you'll see is that in both cases, uh, those lines have not accelerated at the pace that we might anticipate given the overall strength of the labor market. They have clearly been better than they were in 2010, but we haven't seen the type of wage growth yet. And it's going to be interesting to see whether that will change. But part of that story has been the decline in manufacturing jobs between 2000 and 2009, because manufacturing jobs are, as we'll get into, good paying jobs. So the fact that you have fewer manufacturing jobs, that's a definite factor. So what does the outlook look like in terms of thinking about what's happened to manufacturing employment since the Great Recession? Well, as the, green, as the uh, blue line shows, manufacturing employment has been picking up since the Great Recession, but there was a pause in 2015 and 2016 where there was not a lot of job growth. But industrial production, the red line has picked up in 2017. Uh, manufacturing sector confidence has as well as is depicted by the green line. And the result of that has been an increase in the number of manufacturing jobs. And I think one of the questions is, is, is this a sustainable story? Is this something that can continue? And that's a lot of what Sri will discuss during the course of this webcast. I think one opening question I have, which your next slide deals with, deals with is the question of, has this improvement in the manufacturing employment outlook been evenly distributed across different types of industry groups? Right. I think I think that is a great question to, to begin, uh, Brian. And I think you know one of the things that we did in our research uh, was to take a slightly wider angle from a time perspective to say, all right, you know, we know that, that employment collapsed. We lost about a third of manufacturing workers between 2000 and 2010, and we got some of them back. Uh, but if you take a longer time series, what what's the overall trend? And what you see here is a chart of U.S. output growth, so uh, GDP, a value added growth. Uh, in manufacturing industries. Uh, going back to, to uh, this case from 1980, and what you see is some quite striking divergences uh, in terms of which industries were able to participate in output. Um, and that, and that as, I, as I proceed, you'll see there are some links to, to that and what you see in terms of the labor market as well. So the chart on the left shows you the orange line is, is the typical you know, US manufacturing GDP uh, that you see. This is in, in inflation adjusted terms. And what you find is, you know, it's about it's about two trillion or so uh, is where we are at right now, uh, and you do see, you know, that has been a, a sort of a recovery it's, it's since 2010, which does which has which does help you explain some of what has happened on the employment side. But when you look uh, under that and you say, okay, what industries are driving those trends? You see some remarkable divergences. So the gray line, for instance, is the total manufacturing GDP in the U.S taking out basically two industries, uh, electronics and pharmaceuticals. And if you take those two out, you see a very different picture of growth, uh, of output growth over the last 20, 25 years in the US. So to the extent that you've seen a vast majority of output growth concentrated in electronics and pharmaceuticals, those are industries that, first of all, don't employ a whole lot of people. And also, you know, they are, even though they're manufacturing industries, the value add in those industries doesn't necessarily come from production activities. It comes from research and design and software and, and intellectual property. And so that has pretty significant implications for the labor market. The charts on the right show you where we took that gray line on the left and decomposed that into, into more industries. Because one of the challenges with, with dealing with manufacturing is there's such an extraordinary diversity of industries, everything from aerospace to food. Uh, and so that's really what you see on the right side. And what you find is, you know, we group them into, into these four big groups of industries. Uh, basic consumer goods at the very bottom is basically our shoes and, and apparel and appliances, the kind of stuff that you find in a retail store, uh, where you see the output is pretty low and has been declining for two decades. Um, the, uh, at the very top, locally processed goods are the kinds of stuff that you would expect to see, you know, very labor intensive, but not traded 
manufacturing industries. So food and beverage, some of the metals and plastics kinds of components in supply chains. Uh, there also you've seen a decline. The U.S. output today is about where it was about 15, 20 years ago, and it hasn't really, hasn't really recovered. And then the only place where you've seen a recovery is in vehicles and heavy machinery, which explains why you had the employment growth over the last, you know, since 2010, because you had a cyclical rebound in demand for things like cars and machinery. And as that cyclical dem demand has petered out, you see that employment has stagnated since 2015 as well. And so that's really what you see is, you know, this kind of a divergence where if you're in computers or electronics or pharmaceuticals, you've seen the output growth, and most other industries you haven't. Now, one of the things we did was to also look at this at the firm level, and we find some even more striking divergences there. So to the extent that uh, any kind of output growth is occurring, it seems to be occurring in the largest companies. And so this is a chart that shows you revenues for uh, divided by firm size. So the orange line is these very large companies uh, with more than a billion dollars in assets on the balance sheet. Uh, their average sales work out to somewhere between five, six billion annually. Uh, and you've seen that to the extent that there's been any growth in US manufacturing industries uh, over the last 20, 25 years, it's been dominated by the very largest companies. This is for the manufacturing sector in aggregate, this chart, but we looked at individual industries like machinery manufacturing, for instance, and you see the same trend playing out. And in some industries, it's actually even more stark than this. So and so as the largest firms dominate the output, the small and mid-sized firms, many of whom are in the supply chain, sort of in that, that large industrial base, which makes up the majority of manufacturing employment in the US, um, those firms are not seeing revenue growth. Uh, you, we, we also did this, you know, so this is obviously looking just at revenue growth, but you can also do these financial metrics in terms of the profit margin uh, or the return on invested capital, and you see the same kinds of trends where the largest firms have significantly higher returns on capital, uh, in some cases exceeding 20%, uh, whereas the small and mid-sized firms are seeing pressures and are barely returning their cost of capital. It's really, uh, uh, and, uh, yes. just, just a quick question. Uh, do you know why that is? Is it related to the trend of uh, increased uh, industry concentration in the United States? Why are the big companies doing better? Right. So I think there is a combination of factors. And um, so you know, we spoke to, uh, through the research, we spoke to metal manufacturers in Cleveland, for instance, food manufacturers across the country, uh, a bunch of these industries where we did interviews. And there are three or four themes that emerge. One is the rise of global competition over the last 25, 30 years, uh, not just from the emerging markets, but even from you know, European firms. Uh, we've had a, a, a somewhat over, um, overvalued currency, which you can't see in the trade-weighted terms, but you do see a bilateral, you know, the currency is much stronger compared to Korean or, or Japanese or, or, or some other currencies. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a rise in global competition which is affecting these largest American companies on the global stage. Um, as they have responded to that, uh, to your point, God, there is industry consolidation, which means that if you are a mid-size or small firm in the supply chain, you are basically you are basically selling into a much more consolidated customer base, and so your relative market power has been declining. Um, that translates to a number of things: uh, more pressure on the prices that you can provide through the supply chain. Uh, more of the working capital risk that smaller and mid-sized firms are taking on. We've done some research in this. You can see some of the charts in the, in the research report that show you the shift in working capital between large firms and small firms. Um, and what that means is that if you're a small and mid-sized firm, um, you are basically kind of exposed. Your cash flow is under, is under constraint. And so it just takes a couple of shocks to then tip you over. One of those shocks was the commodity boom of the last 10, 15 years. Um, so as metal prices went up, for instance, Many of these fabricated metal companies, for instance, in the supply chain, couldn't pass on those price increases to their, to their uh, customers in the supply chain. And so the only thing... make up the majority of employment who are essentially in survival mode and have been in that way that way for about 20 years. Sweet, but a 
commodity price pressures that you describe, yet right. German small and mid-sized firms have continued to do well. They're perceived as being the backbone of the German manufacturing sector. Why has Germany had greater success in protecting its small and medium-sized enterprises than the U.S. has? So I think there are two or three um, attributes here. One is a, a kind of a legacy among the small and mid-sized companies in Germany, um, some of which links back to family ownership, for instance, uh, just sort of a, a general culture of long-term investment, uh, which over the years means that you know these firms generally tend to be more productive. They generally seem to take care of their workers. Uh, and they kind of carve out these niches that have been carved out in some cases for decades, right? These are not necessarily new firms with new products. Sometimes they've been around for a long time. Uh, but that culture of long-term investment uh, and continuous uh, upgrading of the capabilities means that they continue to stay competitive. Now, of course, some people will argue, as, as folks have, that currency plays a role, right? That, uh, that the combination of the euro and German productivity means that there's sort of an inherent advantage. But, you know, to their credit, they've used that uh, they, if, if that does provide a tailwind uh, for German firms, to their credit, they've used it wisely to make sure that they are, you know, make, uh, maintaining their productivity at least to some extent. Uh, and it also helps that the German uh, commons, in a way, so their, their, their apprenticeship system, their talent, and sort of the, the unemployment and reemployment systems are all geared towards sustaining the competitiveness of that larger industrial base. In contrast, if you look at the U.S. Most of these small and mid-sized firms are pretty much fending for themselves, right? There isn't really a significant commons investment that you see across the nation. You do see individual states or counties trying to do things to, to support the, the local manufacturing base. Um, but you don't see the kind of long-term, sustained, at-scale kind of support that you see in Germany for the manufacturing base. Thanks, Ray. So, um, moving to the next slide, uh, you kind of summarized nicely some of the impacts of the on the U.S. Uh, labor market. You, you want to take us through that? Sure. So, basically, you know, so as you think about um, the implications of this of the of the decline of the industrial sector in the U.S. and you say, okay, what does this mean for labor markets? Um, there are three or four things that come out. So, one, of course, is the fact that there are significant wage pressures on production workers. And that is reflected in the fact that most of those workers work at firms that are seeing income pressures. Um, you're also seeing a regional divergence. Now, one of the things about manufacturing that is valuable for an economy is that it's very regionally uh, distributed. Um, and so when you see the kind of income issues, they tend to, they, they tend to affect many regions, uh, but they also tend to be persistent in those regions. And I'll talk to that a little bit. And then if you see overall, that combination of declining revenue and investment growth means that productivity growth is slowing. And that risks uh, future competitiveness, especially as the worker, as the workforce ages in the U.S. And of course, we do see coming forward, you know, more changes in terms of technology and automation. Uh, and that's going to change skill requirements, among others. So we can we, I can walk you through some of these slides in a little bit more detail. Uh, and and um, so that will help shed some more light on, on why these implications come to the fore. Yes, yes, please do. So this is a chart that shows you the wage growth in manufacturing industries. So this is, uh, again, if you take those industries that I talked about in terms of output, and you basically see that you know your total manufacturing uh, wages have been mostly flat. Uh, you know, your average wage used to be about 19.6. It's now about $20. Um, so, you know, over 25 years, it hasn't really budged a lot. That hides the disparities. So to the extent that there's been any growth, it is primarily in those tech-driven products, so pharmaceuticals and, and electronics and computers, that have seen significant growth. Um, you've also seen an increase in basic consumer goods, which is much more a reflection of a mixed shift in the occupations, because they, this is the one segment that saw a massive employment loss and so as low-skilled workers uh, lost their jobs in this, in this group of industries, you've seen the average wage rise. Uh, it's still not very much. Though. If you look at you know, 10.7 to 13, it's still the lowest paid uh, of all the manufacturing industries. But if you look at the industries that, that account for the majority of employment, uh, vehicles, um, you know, food, fabricated metals, rubber and plastics, you see that in those cases, the real wage has actually gone down from about 18 to 17.7, from 24.5 to 23.5. And so you see that wage growth has been significantly muted in most manufacturing industries. 
Now, yeah. combined with that is the fact that these firms have been shifting more towards contingent labor force. So to the extent that when you see this output growth coming, uh, you do see you know it coinciding with an increase in contingent work as well. John, well, I don't know if you want to say something about this slide. Yeah, I, I think, as, as you mentioned, three, uh, part of the uh, weakness in wages also has to do with the shift uh, from uh, regular uh, employees to contingent workers. So we kind of uh, show this here in, in two, uh, two measures. Um, the blue line is, the, um, is, is based on tax data of uh, self-employed people who are not employers themselves. So in most cases, they are kind of independent contractors. Uh, and you see that uh, over the years, there was a steady trend of uh, using more of those independent uh, contractor in manufacturing jobs as opposed to um, regular employees. A, a second trend is uh, the uh, orange line here is the share of uh, administrative and support services industry, which is essentially almost all of them are temp help workers. So what is the share of temple workers in total production worker workers and we see also a, an increasing a trend there so um, overall we're seeing a shift from a, still the majority of workers are regular employees but uh, we are seeing some trend uh, in recent years of a shift from a regular employees to people who are either work in a temp help industry or people who are independent contractors usually those people have uh, uh, the, the companies themselves don't need to pay them benefits and y usually other things equal wages are also a little lower so that explains some of the uh, slowdown in wage growth i think uh, a lot of this increase that we've seen especially since uh, 2008 is due to the very weak uh, labor market that we had in the u.s economy so uh, uh, people uh, couldn't find a regular job so they uh, became contingent workers uh, and uh, I, I wonder how sustainable that is as we move to a stronger labor market if uh, those people uh, prefer a regular full-time job if they'll um, stop offering their services to temp help industries and uh, find a, a regular full-time job if we will see some uh, reversal in this uh, trend i don't know if uh, brian or three you have any thoughts on, on that as we move forward so I think it's definitely been a long-term trend uh, going back even to the 1980s and 1990s, this shift towards temporary work, uh, towards temporary or flexible or alternative work arrangements in manufacturing. Uh, I think given a lot of the factors in terms of global competitiveness Sri is going to talk about, it's going to be very difficult for manufacturing firms to go back towards a more permanent employee model. But I think one of the important things to keep in mind is, A, some of the manufacturing jobs that have gone away haven't really gone away. They've just migrated into other industries. There's nonetheless been a decline in the number of workers who are involved in production work. But some of those jobs have, in fact, migrated into that administrative and support industry. And I think what your next slide deals with, Sri, is this question of what effect has the decline in manufacturing jobs had on the labor share of income going to employees. And one of the important aspects of this is this shift away from manufacturing work towards uh, contingent work arrangements. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think that's right. And, you know, so, uh, I mean, this is much more of a macroeconomic kind of concern, right, where people have talked about this this notion that the labor share of the U.S. economy, which used to be, depending on how you measure it, is somewhere between 60 to 65 percent and has been declining since the 80s. Uh, that's what you see on the chart on the left. Um, and, you know, the question was, how much is manufacturing driving that? And, you know, the the, the ingoing hypothesis is always, well, you know, it's a sector that makes up about 9, 10% of employment in the US. Is it really going to be a significant driver of that decline? And it turns out it actually is a significant, it, it actually explains more than two thirds of that decline in the labor share comes from the manufacturing sector. And that is a combination of, of as God and, and, and Brian were talking about, right, this the shift in the mix of labor within manufacturing towards contingent, uh, 
uh, towards other kinds of sort of lower skill work in some cases. Um, and then also this notion that the sector itself seems to have lost competitiveness and the fact that the output trends have diverged so significantly between industries that don't employ a whole lot of people and pretty much everybody else in that industry. And so you see, you know, about 68 to 70 percent of the decline in the labor share of GDP has been driven by that decline in, in the manufacturing output and in the, in the uh, wages of workers in manufacturing. Now, there is a regional dimension, as I said, right? So that decline is felt uh, pretty strongly in, in, in the 500 or so counties, which, by the way, is quite a striking figure that you, despite 20 years of decline, manufacturing is still the primary economic activity both in terms of GDP and employment, in, in more than 500 of the 3,000 odd counties in the US. Uh, but in those counties, what we've seen is, you know, that, that decline is felt very strongly. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the sort of the political dimensions of all of that. Uh, but certainly what you see is, you know, that there is a very strong local and regional dimension to all this. Um, and so, uh, you know, there has been, as I said, that recovery uh, since, since 2009, 2010, uh, which was concentrated in, in automobiles and machinery, sort of that, that segment of manufacturing industries, uh, that has definitely helped those counties that specialized in those, uh, in those industries. So that, a lot of that is found in the Midwest and in, in some of the South. Right. No, exactly. I mean, what this chart shows is sort of the happy story we've seen over the past eight years in some of those counties, as Sri mentioned, are so reliant on manufacturing jobs. I mean, you can see in Michigan, we've had the revival of the auto industry. In many parts of the industrial South, you can see double digit growth in manufacturing, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. So over the last eight years, a lot of the job losses that we saw due in part to globalization, due in part to automation between 2000 and 2009. If you saw this chart from 2000 to 2009, all of it would be orange and red, especially uh, the areas that are most reliant on manufacturing jobs. But the question is, can this revival in manufacturing in the most manufacturing heavy regions last? And what is the role going to be, Sri, of the fact that Americans are tending to move less between states than they have been in the past. And if manufacturing jobs do not continue to increase in numbers in some of the states that are relying on them more, what is going to happen? So I think uh, this question of uh, labor mo market mobility is an important part of the manufacturing uh, uh, competitiveness story. So maybe you can speak a little more about that subject. Yeah, I think that's a great point because I think, you know, uh, the reason this kind of local and regional trend becomes important is because uh, this, you know, we are not as mobile as we used to be as a nation. Um, and so that certainly means that, you know, whatever region you're in, the regional dynamics you know, essentially become your destiny in a sense, much more than it used to be. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as an example, I mean, this is just one chart that shows you the domestic migration. And you can see that, you know, one in 20 residents changed addresses for the longest time, right? That's, that's you know, that, sorry, one in five. And that, that's a pretty significant uh, rate of mobility. I mean, if you sort of imagine, you know, almost an apartment building with five apartments in it, and every year one of those apartments would see a churn in residence, that's quite striking. Um, and so we were, you know, significantly more mobile than, than countries in Europe, for instance. Uh, that has declined since the early 90s for a variety of reasons that has declined um, almost by half. And so what that means is that essentially, you know, where you are mean, is, 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 is what's going to drive your, uh, your income. Now, uh, what that means, again, is, you know, as, as a nation, we've often thought about manufacturing at a national level. But these sorts of local dynamics mean that we have to figure out how you do local investments, how do you bolster local economies, uh, or we address the mobility issue and try to restore some of the mobility um, to, to try to counter some of these issues. Let, let me, I, I want to go back to, um, I think there was an interesting uh, thing in, in the map here that uh, the Midwest and the South, the industrial South, they gained a lot of the manufacturing uh, jobs since 2009-2010. 
2009, but the, the northeast kept on shedding those jobs. I, I don't know, it's uh, probably difficult to, to exactly answer why that is, but any thoughts of why uh, we see more of that uh, job gains in the Midwest than in the northeast? So I think one thing to keep in mind, Sri's already mentioned this point, is that a lot of that revival in manufacturing employment is in vehicle and heavy machinery manufacturing. A lot of that is taking place in Michigan and the industrial south. Less of that is taking place in the northeast. So the northeast, in order to gain manufacturing jobs, would be more reliant on some of the other industries uh, that Sri has and his team have broken down manufacturing employment into. So that's a key part of that story. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I mean, just to give you an instance, right, in, in, in 2005, there were about 15 or 16 million vehicles that were sold in the U.S. In 2009, that fell to about 9 million. And by 2015, we were back at 15, 16 million, right? So, those, so that's a significant in, a cyclical rebound in demand for automobiles which, as Brian said, happens to have, you know, that, that happens in the Midwest and the industrial south. And if you have that kind of demand, then that filters through the supply chain. So more metals, more production, more, more electronics into the automotive supply chain. And all of that happens to, uh, it happens in the Midwest and the industrial south. Okay. We do have some more regional research that's coming on the tail of the U.S. report that we published. Um, and that's, you know, so in a couple of months, we'll have sort of the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic view. Because what we do find, uh, Gad, is that, the, while the industry mix explains the majority of this, uh, you find that even industries that grew, so like pharmaceuticals or technology, uh, didn't grow in the in this region, in the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. And so there has been a general decline of competitiveness in these states, uh, oh. even beyond the industry mix. Oh, that's interesting. We have uh, one question here from the audience. Uh, has voluntary turnover rates in manufacturing changed given this uh, shift? Um, I can, uh, I, I don't know the, the, I don't know of a measure that goes way back uh, decades, but I can tell you that um, in the, in, during this expansion, uh, voluntarily quit rates um, were uh, at uh, historically lows uh, right after the Great Recession. And since then, and especially in the past two years, they recovered dramatically to the point that you see quit rates that are now equal to the quit rates of 2007. So um, there, uh, there has been, a, at least in this expansion, there has been uh, a significant uh, cyclicality, but we're back to where we were in 2007. I, I don't know if Brian or Sri, if you have any insights on kind of the long run trends in, uh, in labor, voluntary labor turnover uh, in the manufacturing sector. Well, one thing I can say is that if you, there was recently, the Federal Reserve each month compiles a beige book of insights from regional uh, branches that deal with the question of what is going on in local labor markets. And uh, the, the Cleveland Fed reported that there was a tightening in the local labor market for low wage jobs, particularly in the manufacturing sector, that uh, firms were having more difficulty retaining lower wage and lower skilled workers. So that's an indication that A, wage growth may be on the horizon, B, it sort of speaks to uh, that question. But I think another important point is that a lot of the, and your next slide deals with this question, a lot of the ability of firms to, uh, for, of local areas to attract uh, manufacturing jobs deals with the question of attracting foreign investment. So what is happening in terms of the ability of counties to attract foreign investment and how is that influencing labor market performance? So I think, you know, um... This links back, I think, to the question, the, the discussion we had about the German model uh, and how that plays out in the U.S. So in the U.S., I think, you know, essentially what is what, given the decline and given the widespread nature of the manufacturing footprint, uh, you have basically got states and counties essentially um, fighting for investment. Now, this is a chart that shows you foreign investment, which for some reason is, is easier to track than domestic investment in the U.S. I'm not quite sure why that is. 
Uh, but we'd expect to see the same trend if we did domestic investment as well. Uh, but basically, what you see is is two or three things that I can point out through this chart. One is, to the extent that you're getting investment in manufacturing counties, it is not widespread. There are a relatively small number of counties, uh, in this case the blue ones, that vastly outperform the other manufacturing counties in terms of the investment that they get. That's one point. The other point is that there's really no correlation between the investments that are coming in and any kind of changes in the labor market, whether that's measured in terms of the unemployment rate on the x-axis or the income growth on the y-axis. Uh, and so that lends itself to a whole bunch of questions about why that is. You know, we've tried different lag periods. It doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Uh, and, but by and large, what you do see is, you know, investment is not directly translating to any labor market benefits. You've also seen that, you know, given this kind of every man for himself sort of a dynamic in the U.S. in terms of the regional dynamics, uh, a, a significant increase in the number of incentives that local and state governments are offering to companies. Uh, a lot of those are manufacturing companies. You know, they've, so that total number of incentives has more than tripled as a share of GDP in the last 20 years, uh, with, again, no correlation between those incentives and any kind of labor. Right. And then... Uh... Well, one thing that uh, you have this slide here on the productivity growth, which is uh, directly related to investment. Right. One thing that I was struck by is if you look at total manufacturing, there was no, if I uh, just want to make sure that me and, and the readers are, and the audience are understanding this. So if you look at total manufacturing, there was no productivity improvement at all in the past seven years. That's that's basically yes that is that is basically correct. There is now of course the this also you know there is one group of industries that's not included here right because there are five groups of manufacturing industries mm -hmm. and the one that's not included is the electronics and pharmaceutical industry that group of technology driven innovative products where you know there is a little footnote here that says if you look if you if you put that in that that line goes off this chart. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that there has been any productivity growth over the last 15, 20 years, you know, obviously, as we know, a lot of it was concentrated in the technology, the computer electronics sector. People have talked about the measurement issues and sort of the spillover gains from those from that industry into others. But yes, by and large, what you find is that uh, the vast majority of manufacturing industries have not seen any kind of productivity growth during this recovery. That's uh, astonishing. Yeah. Yes, but it is, you know, it is consistent with the trends that we've seen in output and investment, right? Because if you've seen the majority of the industrial base is not seeing output growth and is seeing pressures on cash flows, then the firms are going to defer investment. And got to your point, if they defer investment, you're not going to see productivity growth eventually. Yeah. And one thing that has underlied uh, some of the uh, recent trends in productivity growth is the change in terms of the skill makeup of employees in each of the five sectors that uh, the McKinsey Group has broken down uh, manufacturing employment into. And what you'll see here is that between the blue and the orange period, it, between 2003 and 2009, uh, in the non-BA categories across just about all of these sectors, uh, employment goes down among non-BA workers, whereas it holds steady among those more skilled positions who have a BA or above. And that's the period when most of the productivity gains that Sri's previous chart was describing occur. Whereas between 2010 and 2016, uh, jobs for both non-BA and BA workers are increasing, and that's when you have slower productivity gains across uh, all of these sectors, with the exception of that uh, tech-driven innovation product sector. And I think part of the reason, another reason why we've seen this productivity slowdown is exactly what you're showing on the next chart, which is that US firms have not made the type of investment in terms of robotics that we've seen in other countries with similar levels of uh, wealth. 
Yes, I think I think that's right. You know, often when people talk about the decline of manufacturing employment in the U.S., you know, one of the causes that people call out is automation and technology, and that's really not quite true. Uh, because if that was the case, you would have seen output continue to increase, and you would have seen productivity growth continue to to, to sustain itself, and that clearly didn't happen. Uh, and so as what you see is, you know, the the intensity of automation in the U.S. is much lower than most of our advanced economy. Uh, competitors, other other large manufacturing nations like Korea and Germany and Japan. Now, to some extent, that is a reflection of the industry mix. One of the advantages, one of the strengths of the U.S. manufacturing sector is its extraordinary diversity. It is a really, really diverse manufacturing sector. Uh, and in that sense, a little bit different from the German or Japanese or Korean uh, sector, which, uh, manufacturing sector, which tends to be a little bit more specialized uh, in automobiles and electronics. Uh, not entirely, of course, there are large, you know, chemical and metal firms coming out of those countries too, but they are certainly more specialized in automobiles and electronics where you do see the majority of the industrial robots being deployed, as you can see on the chart on the right, and that's just true globally. And so, you know, part of it is a, com is, is a lag in is, is industries that are part of the U.S. manufacturing sector that have not automated, and part of it, going back to the point that I made earlier, is a significant chunk of the industrial base, even in automobiles and electronics in the U.S., that have not made investments in, in automation. Yeah, the, the, the gap here, for example, between uh, South Korea and, and the U.K. is uh, they are right. almost from two different uh, planets. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's right. I mean, you know, it's interesting that the some of the trends that you see in the U.S. in terms of uh, you know, in terms of the decline, uh, the decline in output, the current employment, I mean, I think the UK is really about the only other country in, in the advanced economies that matches what the US is seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one interesting way that we looked at it was to look at the trade deficit, the value added trade deficit and the, the actual gross trade deficit, specifically in advanced industries. So, you know, the kind of R&D intensive industries like cars and, and, and aircraft and medicines and, and machinery in those kinds of industries. And you find that the US and the UK have a very large and rapidly growing trade deficit in those industries. And that's reflective of the fact that that supply chain is getting hollowed out. Uh, and so you're getting less and less competitive in that in that industrial base for those industries. Right. We're now getting to one of the, the hottest uh, topics uh, or research topics in the past uh, decade, I would say, uh, which uh, there are several organizations that um, are trying, are asking a very, very difficult question, which is uh, what kind of jobs are, will be automated in the future? And um, I know three that in a, in a separate report, um, McKinsey uh, made, that just came out recently, and McKinsey made a strong effort to uh, answer that question. So uh, um, w what are kind of the main takeaways from that? So I think one one key takeaway is all, people often think of this as robots versus humans or robots versus jobs, and that really isn't the right way to look at it. I mean, the way to look at it is, you know, we all have jobs, and the jobs involve multiple tasks, and some of those tasks get automated away, and the question is what happens to the others. And so this is a chart that, you know, what, one of the things that we did was to look at the task level decomposition of the U.S. labor market. And we said, okay, how much time is spent on these different tasks. And, you know, we kind of group them in terms of, you know, do you manage and supervise people? Are you interacting with customers or, or other kinds of stakeholders? Are you basically in sort of the data and some kind of a, an information processing phase? Or are you in a, in a kind of a highly uh, predictable environment where very, very routine kinds of tasks that you're performing? And as you can imagine, the more automation you expect, the more those sorts of predictable tasks could get automated away. So this is a potential to automate based on automation technologies that currently exist. And we're not just talking about industrial robots, we're talking about you know, robotic process automation, for instance, virtual agents, those are all included in this mix of, of automation. And I think one very interesting thing about this chart, and it shows up in the next chart, is the question of why is it that manufacturing uh, is so susceptible to automation? and what are some of the uh, key components uh, in terms of the task makeup of manufacturing jobs that lead it to being more susceptible to automation than most other sectors? Right. I mean, it's almost, you know, it's almost the flip side of the fact that manufacturing has been a big productivity driver for many decades, right? Which means if you go into a manufacturing plant, you are going to see some pretty rigorous 
uh, workflows, right? Pretty well-defined workflows, pretty kind of uh, much more, much less unpredictability on a manufacturing factory floor than, for instance, in a legal office, for instance. Uh, and so that means that, you know, weirdly, what it also means is that that kind of environment is much more susceptible to having a machine being deployed to do some of those tasks. And so you see, as this chart shows, you know, a big red circle under the predictable physical um, category for manufacturing. And, you know, so some of these industries like manufacturing or transport, uh, which have seen wage pressures over the last 20, 25 years, are also ironically some of the industries where you would expect to see the largest potential for automation. And I think what's helpful about this framework, Sri, is that, uh, is that it sort of shows where is it that manufacturing work is most likely to be automated. And on this next slide, it's helpful in the sense, and I'm gonna have Gad talk about some of our labor shortages work, but when you think about a mechanical engineer and you think about this column that we have on the end, which is automation risk, which is based on an earlier report from two uh, professors from Oxford University that sort of deals with occupations as a whole. Is this job likely to be totally automated or not? But when you think about mechanical engineers, this question of collecting data, this is an element of a job of a mechanical engineer, which while the entire job may not get automated away, uh, that portion can be automated and can allow mechanical engineers to spend more time doing more creative and intuitive work. So Gad, how do we think about uh, which production occupations are more or less likely to experience labor shortages over the next decade? Right, and, and uh, when we think about that, there are other factors beyond the uh, automation or the likelihood of computerization to, uh, to impact that. Um, so what we did, and uh, some of our audience, I think, is familiar with that uh, work, we looked at close to 500 occupations and we tried to uh, rank them according to the risk of uh, um, labor shortages in the coming decade. And we looked at it in several dimensions, and the column um, all the way to the left is the overall kind of rank, so machinists, for example, which is uh, very popular in manufacturing uh, plants, is um, it says 90%, which means that machinist is at a higher risk of labor shortages than 90% of occupation. And, and why machinists are ranked so high, um, it's because there is a, uh, we expect a large gap between demand and supply uh, in, in that uh, group. So machinists, like a lot of other skilled trade labor, uh, the growth in uh, the demand for machinists is not uh, uh, that uh, large. Uh, it's probably uh, slightly below average for the U.S. economy compared to other occupations. But uh, what we do see, the um, supply for uh, of machinists is uh, um, very weak uh, for two reasons. One, uh, there are a lot of retirements uh, among machinists. A lot of those uh, uh, skilled trade labor, uh, they have a lot of baby boomers who are about to retire, and machinists are among them. And there are also some of the jobs that don't attract a lot of young people. Those are not the cool and sexy jobs that uh, the young generation wants to get into. So that we have a lot of retirements and few new entrants, and that's why we uh, these, the, those uh, trends are not favorable for that uh, um, occupation. We're also looking at other um, uh, features of job. We, we measure flexibility and that idea there is if you have a shortage in a certain occupation and a certain location, how much flexibility does the employer has in dealing with this shortage? Can they um, use their uh, remote working? Can they offshore the job? Can they automate the job? Uh, and uh, uh, some... Um, so for example, computer-related uh, jobs uh, are very uh, flexible because you can, uh, if you have a, a you, you can offshore computer-related jobs, you can do remote workers, teleworkers. So this measures uh, how uh, flexible um, this uh, job is. 
And we also looked at, uh, at the skills related. Of course, it's easier to replace a retail sales worker than it is to replace a, a mechanical engineer, which you can just take from the street and put uh, in your um, plant. And so, for example, mechanical engineers are ranked uh, very high uh, in terms of uh, the skills required. So when we aggregate uh, all of those uh, and the automation risk here goes into the flexibility uh, of the of the job, we see that uh, the list we chose a few occupations that uh, are uh, very uh, common in manufacturing, and we see um, you know in some of them like machinists and mechanical engineers, the risk of shortages is very high. Uh, but as we move uh, down, when we go to the um, lower skilled and, and uh, occupations that have better demographical demographic outlook, we see that uh, some of them, um, the risk of labor shortages is not that significant in the coming years. So the question then is, Sri, we can see why certain types of occupations, especially high-skilled occupations and also uh, occupations that have an older workforce, are likely to experience labor shortages. But the question is, A, where are future manufacturing jobs likely to come from? What types of industries are they likely to appear in? And what are some steps that businesses in the US can take to become more competitive and to help realize some of the more optimistic scenarios that your report lays out for manufacturing employment? Right. I mean, it, you know, it might be hard to believe, but given given everything we've just talked about, but there are actually optimistic scenarios out there. Um, and I think part of that goes back to the to the diversity of the U.S. industrial base. Um, we actually think, you know, we did some some sizing efforts uh, to say, you know, we could actually be boosting uh, manufacturing GDP by almost half a trillion uh, in annual terms by 2025. Now, that's not going to create the millions and millions of of you know, relatively low to mid-skill workers on assembly lines. It, it, this is not that sort of a manufacturing sector, as, as we all, I think, uh, understand. Um, but what it does do is, is is create income and investment growth, specifically in those communities that we talked about. It. And I think that is an important aspect that people often forget, is that as we think about job growth, uh, at the end of the day, we should be talking about income growth. Uh, and so if you're seeing job growth where workers are on food stamps or wages are flat, then that's not really solving the problem. It certainly helps, uh, but it's not completely solving the problem. And so these growth trends are essentially driven off of uh, three or four opportunities that we see on the horizon. One, of course, is pretty significant demand growth, both in domestic and foreign markets. Um, but it's a different sort of demand than, for, than companies are used to. And that's one of the things that we've seen companies struggling with a little bit. And that's one, that's one of the things that you, the, the leading companies are now sorting out is how do you shorten your product cycles? How do you move from a, uh, a goods oriented, you know, I'm going to make this thing and sell it to a much more service oriented revenue model where, you know, your customers are looking for total cost of ownership. They're looking for turnkey solutions. Uh, and that's just to the benefit of manufacturing firms because that dampens the volatility in the revenue stream if you can move to a contract-based servicing arrangement. And so you're, you're seeing that sort of growth of usage and service models um, showing up in manufacturing. Um, you're also seeing, seeing a shift in where the profits are generated in the value chain. Um, and so and that means that uh, companies are rethinking the way they even think about their location decisions. So it's not a straightforward labor cost arbitrage should I go to China? Should I come back? It's not that sort of a, an argument. It's much more, you know, where is the talent? Where is the supply base? Uh, where do I keep the data assets? Where do I generate the data assets? Um, and how do I get the most productivity out of what I have? Um, and linked to that is the is the role of technology, not just automation, but broadly digital technologies uh, in terms of digital threads that connect suppliers and, and customers. Uh, you know, self-organizing sorts of factories that can figure out, you know, self-deploy against certain types of needs, uh, you know, inventory control that can be automated, those sorts of issues, those sorts of things, you are seeing leading companies now starting to make those investments. Uh, and if we do that, you know, as I said, there's a, there's a significant strength in the U.S. in terms of the ecosystem of R&D, of startups, you know, of the domestic supplier base that is still there, despite the fact that it's been suffocating for 20 years, it's still there. Uh, and so, that does give us room for hope that you can actually turn this around. 
Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of these just to say, you know, what does it, what would it take? And one thing that we have seen from the German or the Korean or the Japanese model uh, is that it's difficult to do this uh, single-handedly for any count, any for any state or county or company. There has to be some kind of a coordinated action to strengthen that supplier ecosystem, more collaboration through the supply chain. Uh, we certainly need, in number two, much more export participation. There's a strong link between exports and productivity. Uh, and so, you know, the U.S. is one of the least trade exposed in terms of the number of companies that participate in exports. And so there's a lot more we can do, both in terms of the export and on the flip side in terms of the foreign investment. Uh, and then I would just want to call out number five and number six. You know, number five, going to the point about skills. As much as we like to see companies, you know, deploying apprenticeship programs, what we'd like to see is an improvement in labor mobility, not just geographically, but across boundaries of companies and industries, because that's how incomes go, go up. Uh, but what that means is you need credentialing systems or skill uh, taxonomies that translate from one industry to another, from one state to another. Uh, and finally, number six, you know, we are looking for long-term capital to come into the sector because this is not an industry that responds well to short-term incentives or fragmented incentives. Well, we just heard that uh, Apple is bringing back uh, 250 billion dollars uh, from the repatriated uh, profit. So hopefully some of that will go to manufacturing investment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I think we have uh, two or three more minutes uh, to go. Uh, do you want to uh, talk about the, the remaining slides here, three? Um, I can quickly go through a couple of these, and I just want to, you know, um, I'll, I'll have back to you folks for, for closing thoughts. You know, I think it is important to understand, yes, as much as we want to talk about jobs, the role of manufacturing is not a job creator, as much as people like to talk about it that way. It is, it is a disproportionate contributor to broad-based income growth, to investment, to productivity, and to trade. And those are the kinds of things that you want to try to focus on as we try to revitalize manufacturing. One of the things we said in the report is that the decline of manufacturing in the U.S. is not uh, inevitable. There is somehow this narrative that manufacturing is in natural decline as a share of the economy, and that's fine, but it's more the absolute trend is what we're concerned about here. Uh, and there's really no reason to believe that that should be inevitable. Um, right. And I will just close it out with, you know, the fact that this research and all of our other research on automation and future work is, is available on, on the website. Right. And uh, as usual, uh, great stuff coming out of uh, McKinsey. Uh, thank you very much, Sri, for, for coming today and sharing your insights with us. I just uh, want to end with a couple of uh, um, plugins for a future webcast that we will have. Uh, uh, one uh, on uh, February 14th, uh, Brian will be here together with um, two other guests uh, to talk about, uh, in, in our next economics watch, insight from law, how case filing data from Legal Shield illuminates key economic trends. That is a, a very interesting uh, webcast. And uh, in general, uh, we have uh, a lot of publications and webcasts that uh, I wanted to um, wanted you to see. Um, some of the uh, some of them are on this uh, web page. Um, and uh, finally, I want to uh, ask you if you have a, a minute after we conclude here to fill um, a brief evaluation. We would uh, really appreciate that uh, to make future webcasts even better. Um, so let me um, see if I can pronounce your name correctly now, Three, uh, I want to thank Sri uh, Ramaswamy. Bingo. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Brian Shaitkin, which is, um, I'm used to that name um, over the years. So thank you both for being uh, here today and sharing your insight with us. And I want to thank the audience for uh, listening to us. And uh, we will hopefully see you in future webcasts.